Hello, fellow children of God. Philip Shields here. I've got a vital topic for you. If you have a lingering health issue or something bad has happened to you, but you consider yourself a solid child of God, full of faith, or if you know anyone who has a lingering health issue or has even had a recent death among faithful children of God, this teaching is for you. I've been focusing a lot lately on healing, since we're not seeing many healings among believers. We're seeing some, but we should be seeing many more, I think. So in part one of my three parts on healing that I've just recently done, this isn't really a part four, it's a different topic, but in part one I discuss some spectacular healings in our time, in fact. Part two, I discuss ways we may be demonstrating unbelief and lack of faith without even knowing it, without realizing it. Certainly if we have strong unbelief, uh, makes healing very, very difficult to happen, uh, as, as I covered in, in there. Then in part three, we covered, please hear this one, because it has some new material I haven't covered before, haven't heard others cover before. Uh, eight keys that could unlock more healings. And part three had some new concepts. Be sure to hear all of these. And let people know about these sermons, please. When someone who is faithful, full of faith, obedient, child of God doesn't get healed, but in fact gets worse or dies, is that because he or she lacked faith or was a terrible sinner necessarily? Why isn't God healing more? He has all the power to, to heal, to restore health, to grant blessings. Uh, he does grant a lot of blessings to all of us, but why does he hold back in as, doing as many as we would like to see him do? I've had people to say, say to me that, boy, if I, if I had the power God has, I, I, I'd sure be healing a lot more people. I'd sure be answering a lot more prayers positively. Uh, let's talk about that. Many believe that if we just would have enough strong faith, God is obligated to heal us. God will always heal us, they say. All it takes, they believe, is strong faith. They also, those same people, tend to believe that God's will is always to heal. God always wants to heal us. And so if someone is not healed, they say, it's their fault. Many believers can't imagine it could ever be God's will not to heal for his own good reasons. Does that happen? Does God, is God's will sometimes not to heal? Let's talk about all that. It's true that Jesus said several times when asked if he was willing to heal a leper, for example, in Matthew 8, the first two or three verses, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me cleansed from this clean, from this leprosy. And Jesus said, I am willing. Touched him and healed him. Mark 1, verses 40, 41, same thing. And the other one was Matthew 8, the first few verses. We're told that all who came to Jesus for healing were healed. Matthew 8, verses 16 to 17. The only exception was in his hometown where they probably didn't even come to him for healing because they knew this boy Jesus had grown up as a teenager there and they had unbelief. So because of their unbelief, it says in Mark 6, the first five verses or so, uh, Jesus was unable to do any mighty works there except a few because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. So lack of faith is certainly a powerful denier of healing. All that's true. But keep in mind that when Yeshua, this is very important what I'm about to say, when Yeshua, when Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, his miracles and his healings were to show more than just his compassion, were to show more than just his power. They were also to prove and demonstrate that he was the promised Messiah, the promised Savior, the Christ, the Anointed One. John 7.31, some of them had said, many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ, the Anointed One, comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? So it was to show that he was the Messiah. So he healed them all. He was demonstrating, he represented the kingdom of God. Luke eleven twenty. I'm not casting demons out by Beelzebub. That wouldn't make sense, he says the verse before. 
Luke eleven twenty. No, this is to show you the kingdom of God is nigh. So he was showing who he was by the fact that he healed everybody who came to him. Then later, when the apostles began the new covenant church, the many signs, wonders, healings, and miracles confirmed by God was obviously empowering them, and it helped get the church started strongly. I mean, if you knew that, boy, everybody who comes to these 12 apostles are getting healed. And this guy Peter, boy, just get in his shadow and you'll be healed. I mean, wouldn't that spread the word pretty quickly, just as it did and had for Jesus? People from all over were coming. I do personally wonder, though, if after 70 years or after 30 years or 40 years or so, let's say by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, if so many healings and, and miracles continued in the frequency as much as they had been going on for the 40 years earlier. We're not told that in Scripture. We're not told that in history. So I don't know. But certainly I believe to get Christ seen as the Messiah, and to let the people know that the Messiah's church was being started by Peter and the Twelve Apostles and others later. So anyway, um, all this was to help them get started quickly. You, you, I, I'll put down some notes in my scriptures that you can look up. Hebrews 2 verse 4, how God sent these signs and miracles to confirm the work he was doing. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 12.12, 12, Acts 2.43 it's Acts 2.43, Acts 5, verse 12, Acts 14, verse 3. They all say that to confirm the work God was doing. So my focus today is this. I want to ask you, why are so many who have faith, who are righteous people, who are obedient people, not being healed or not having other prayer requests answered fully? <clears throat> I want to contest the notion that all one ever has to have is strong faith because those people who believe that it's always God's will to heal those people with faith I want to contest that there are too many other scriptures that show that just can't always be the case we have to take a little from here a little from there to use the whole Bible the whole counsel of God not just a few verses where Jesus said yes I'm willing to heal and then conclude from that that it's always God's will to heal Use the whole Bible. I hope when we're done you'll understand a bit better why God is not always giving us all the healings and answers we'd love to see and love to ask Him. And this can apply to more than just prayers for healing, like I said. If you're asking for God to lead you to a wonderful wife, a wonderful husband, assuming you're single, for a job, for income to be higher, for protection, for help in these end times, all the needs we have that we go to God with, this the points in the sermon will apply for those as well. Under the heading, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? There's a book, I think, by that. I'm not plagiarizing his book, but uh, it's the same topic. We can be tempted to think, if I had all God's power, I'd sure be doing a lot more than he's doing. Be careful with that. You're not wiser than God. All right? Be careful. So many pastors and brethren believe God would heal everyone, but we get in the way. We get in the way. That's sometimes true, but not always. God has his own good reasons for everything he does. Everything he does has a reason. He has a purpose in allowing us to suffer, as you'll see. And I'll show you how God's will is not always to relieve his saints from all the pain and suffering and illness they're going through. Or it's not always our lack of faith. It's always the reason for non-healing. So, before I get further, though, I want to say I, I want to say a couple things here first. Make sure we understand, God is not going to continue prolonging our lives indefinitely. That seems like a da, and yet it seems like a lot of people believe that. Especially for those of us who are up in age in our seventies. We've had our seventy, and God with God's blessing, maybe 80, as David says. Uh, I've had that. I'm in my 70s or 80s, 90s. They've already lived a good long life. Even King David died at 70. 
And the Bible says, as an old man, 1 Kings 1, 1 to 3, it's appointed to us all to die once, eventually. Hebrews 9, 27, if Christ doesn't return soon. So we shouldn't expect God to keep healing and prolonging our lives indefinitely. Especially if we're already in our 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and older. Sure, we can pray for people who want prayer in their 80s and 90s. And we can hope God heals them. But the fact is, eventually, we all die. We all get old. We all get old in all the this, all this symptoms of aging. Weakness, tiredness, so on. That applies to me, too, in my 70s. So, can... God's not going to continue prolonging our lives forever and ever. The second thing I want to say is knowing what's coming prophetically. My wife Carol and I both are okay if God lets us die so we don't have to see or go through the terrible times coming ahead and watching all our family go through it. Isaiah 57, 1b is a really good verse to know. If I say 1b, I mean the last half of the verse when I say that. And it, it says in there that God lets some of his righteous ones to die to spare them from the evil to come. To save them from the evil to come. That's okay with me. So when some loved ones die, especially if they're not young anymore, remember that. They've at least been spared from seeing and going through the very trying times coming upon us, coming our way very, very soon. Now, many of you believe that God's saints will be spared from the terrible times completely by either going to a place of safety here on earth, or, as many of you believe, pre many believe, uh, Christians believe, in a rapture to heaven, either a place of safety or a rapture, pre-trib, before the trib, or mid-trib like halfway through the seven years, or three and a half years, uh, there would be a rapture. This is the big debate. Is it a pre-trib or mid-trib rapture? And I'm not part of that at all. I do believe we're going to heaven when Christ comes back to resurrect the dead and, the, and those of us still alive to change us and bring us to him. I do believe personally that we will then go to heaven to get married. Because you can read very clearly in Revelation 14 and 15, the first few verses of each of those, that the 144,000 are standing there in heaven in front of the thrones. Revelation 15, um, thousands are standing on the sea of glass. So the rapture people always use these scriptures that apply more to a resurrection than a rapture. They always use 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, and 1 Corinthians 15. Those aren't rapture scriptures. Those are resurrection scriptures. I believe protection is strongly hinted at, but I don't think it means that we're never going to have any test of our faith. We're not going to have any hard times at all. If, 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 if not outright promised, it's strongly hinted at for the end-time Christians who really know their Savior, the Philadelphia type of Christians, Revelation 3.10 of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, they're told that they'll be protected from the time of great trouble coming upon the whole earth. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my command to persevere, you didn't quit on me, you didn't give up, I, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from that hour of trial. So they're promised some kind of protection. And when you go to Revelation 12, it talks about the children of this woman, who gives birth, and how they're taken to the wilderness, to her place in the wilderness. Revelation 12, verses 13 to 16. To her place in the wilderness, where they will be nourished, fed, taken care of, for time, times, and half a time, for three and a half years. So if I can be a part of that, well, wonderful. But our focus must not be on protection. Our focus must be on Jesus Christ and trusting him to do what he wants to do with us. Those who seek to save their skin will lose it. Isn't there a verse that says that? Save their lives. All right, so let's not do that. But remember, too, that uh, the Israelites, best I can tell, went through the first three plagues in Egypt. 
because they hadn't been fully convinced yet. But in our case, we might be fully con convinced, but God may still let us go through a lot of, a lot of testing. Okay? The first three plagues. Uh, but notice something that the rapture believers never seem to mention. Not all the saints are protected during the Great Tribulation. They're not all in heaven, whether you, the rapture happens or not. They're not all in heaven. There are just so many scriptures that clearly state that the coming beast power will, have, will make war against the saints and prevail against them until God finally intervenes. Write down on your own. I'm going to give you a link to a sermon I gave about the place of safety. But write down on your own these verses so you can see what I'm talking about. Revelation 13, 7. Some are going to get beheaded. Believers, saints, I'm talking about. They're not all in heaven, rapture or not. Daniel 7, 21 to 25. Daniel 8, 24 and 25, and others. So we can be protected from all this, either by divine protection in a place that's safe, place of safety, here on earth, or we can be protected from those terrible times by being allowed by God to die. That's another way we can be protected, to die ahead of time, especially if it's a more natural birth, uh, death. That would be wonderful. Uh, I'm okay with dying, okay, if, if it's God's will, now that I'm in my 70s. If I was in my 30s or 40s, I don't know if I'd be... Uh, but if God says, yeah, your time to die is now, I'm going to take you away from this life, then fine. We have to, hey, you guys, I was just talking to a lady named Carol Ann, and her husband's going through a terrible trial. You need to be all, all of you who have faith, be praying for Jeff, Jeff Patton. And he has been going through a terrible time with prostate. And please ask God to heal his pain and heal the problems. But my point is, talking to Carol Ann, who really knows her Bible well, just like my own wife, um, she made the point that, hey, we gave our lives to God. We gave our lives to God years ago. So if he now owns us, he bought us, right? He can do with us as he pleases, right? So he can do with us as he pleases, right? There are less zealous believers who will, not, who will have to be tried in the fire. As the, for example, the Laodiceans. You can read that for yourselves, Revelation 3, 14 to 22. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, Satan goes after the remnant of the saints. He goes after all of them that are going to this place of safety. And then the Satan is rebuked and stopped. So then in Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 12, 17, it says that Satan goes after the remnant of those children, those believers. Those are likely the Laodicean type brethren in the end time. Remember to the Laodiceans, Christ says, I stand at the door, I'm here. To the Philadelphians, he says, I'm coming soon. To the Laodiceans, says, I'm here, I'm knocking on the door. Why is, why is the door to my house? I'm the house, I'm the door, why do you have it shut? Anyway, they will go through a refining. This sermon is not about a sermon on the place of safety, but my point is simple. Don't expect God to keep us all old people alive forever or to keep healing his saints. We shall all die, and that could be during, doing us a favor, as Isaiah 57, 1 says. So let's be zealous and pray that God counts us worthy to escape the things which are coming to us. Luke 21, 36. Make sure you guys read that. Pray that you be counted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass. Luke 21, 36. So if some of us, especially us older ones, are allowed to die before the great tribulation starts, so be it. Hallelujah is what I say. Hallelujah. In other words, those people won't be perpetually healed. I'm going to list in my notes a full-fledged sermon I gave in 2012 on the place of safety. In that sermon, I used the word or name Yahweh. Nowadays, I believe YHVH is pronounced Yehovah. The indications I have, uh, the, the research I have in recent years, done by some, uh, to me, definitely shows it's pronounced Yehovah. 
not Yehovah or not Jehovah. There's no J in Hebrew, so it's Yehovah. But then in that sermon above, I said Yahweh, okay, but you know I mean Yehovah now. Other than that, I think you'll enjoy the sermon. It's in the notes. You just have to look up a place of safety in the search bar. Is it always a lack of faith that causes no healing? I've heard it preached so many times all over the internet too. How Jesus seemed to imply it was just your faith. That's the only thing required. According to your faith, be healed. Be it done according to your faith. Those are all true statements he said. And how they healed all the diseases, who, all the people with diseases who came to him. Why isn't that happening to the same extent today? My brothers and sisters, it's so easy for us to declare and simply believe that we can put God in a box. If only we had enough faith, healing would always result. Is the box. Or God is obligated to heal. It's part of that thinking. And variations, in fact, I got this from a minister in an email the other day. He may not have meant it the way entirely that I'm reading it here. I give him that. But, it, but what he wrote was only faith, trust, and belief are keys to healing. No, there are more keys than that. That's why I gave part three. Eight, eight keys to unlock more healing. It's not only faith and trust and belief that are really a part of faith. So some have come to believe that if we're not being healed, it's always our fault. Somehow. We failed, they said. And we can look at those not being healed, and those who have that belief would conclude they must not have enough faith, or they must have some evil thing going on in their lives. Do you believe that? I do not. It's not biblical if you use all of Scripture. Would any of you say the prophet Elisha, Elisha, was a man of faith? I would. God certainly used him to heal others and have powerful miracles. In 2 Kings 13, verse 14, the first part of the verse, Elisha became sick with the illness of which he would die. He became sick of the illness of which he would die, but he was a man of faith. And then verse 20, then Elisha died, and they buried him. He goes on to say in verse 20 how even a dead man, dead man's body touching his bones, came back to life. He came back to life. God, God was the one who did it, not the bones. But God used even Elisha's bones. But Elisha became sick and wasn't healed. All of you who now believe, up till now believe, that all we need is a lot of faith and we'd be healed, I hope you understand that's a wrong belief on your part. Elisha certainly had faith. Elisha got sick. Elisha died of that sickness. Paul had his thorns in the flesh. Thorn in the flesh. Was not healed from that, whatever that was. Isaac, a wonderful man of faith, was blind, so much so that he was fooled by Jacob. David couldn't stay warm. He got no heat. It says in the King James, I think. He couldn't stay warm at the end of his life. First Kings 1, 1 to 3. He was old and up in age, advanced in years. I'm older than that now. David does claim. In other words, they even brought a beautiful young virgin to lie with him in his bosom to try to get some body heat to warm him up because clothing and blankets wasn't doing a thing. But it says, and David did not know her. So that's good. But anyway, that was Abishag. And I'm sure David had many battle wounds and issues. Look at Psalm 30, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 30, verses 1 to 3. If you're hearing this in audio, it's also in my notes. I will extol you, Jehovah, for you have lifted me up. You have not let my foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord my God, Jehovah my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. And yet, at 70, God didn't. Verse 3, Psalm 30, verse 3. You brought my soul up from the grave. 
you kept me alive. So sometimes he was either very badly, badly wounded or very badly ill. Thought he would die. God healed him. Or some will decide that you must be displeasing God if you're not healed. Job's friends were like that. These people reason that everyone who has faith and is pleasing God will be healed. But again, what about Paul, Elisha, even David? It's simply not always true. So then they reason we must be maybe having something wrong. We're not being fervent enough because after all, isn't the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? That avails much? So maybe we're not being fervent enough. Maybe we're not righteous enough. We're not righteous enough? If you understand 2 Corinthians 5.21 and the end of Romans 4, how we have God's very own righteousness. Romans 4.19-25, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, Christ became for us righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30, and many, many more. I've spoken on that so many times. How much more righteous can a person be than to have the very righteousness of God? So let's use the whole Bible, all the scriptures, all the lessons. Don't just zero in on a few individual verses. Yes, God wants us to have faith, but when we use the whole Bible, we simply cannot say that when healing doesn't take place, it's always because we lacked faith or the person being healed, or prayed over lack faith. No, no, no. In fact, I want to show you how sometimes it's not even the faith of the person being prayed over. Sometimes the person doesn't even ask for healing. God in his mercy still heals. Whose faith is required for healing? It, 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 you know, where, where faith is something God's looking at, yeah, he wants to see the person being healed to have faith, but look at some other things. Luke 13, there's a woman who was bent over really badly for 18 years because Satan had bound her. This woman bound by Satan, okay? Bound by Satan, by spirit of infirmity. She didn't ask Jesus, according to the story in Luke 13. She didn't come and ask Jesus if she could be healed. Jesus went to her, announced that she was now healed of that touched her, and bang, she was straight up. She didn't even ask. It was entirely Jesus' faith and command. Acts 3, be turning over there if you have your Bible open. There was a lame man there who was there for many years and was hoping that some people would give him some money, alms money. When Peter and John came up, he thought they might give him some money. He was healed, though he wasn't even asking for healing. He was asking for money. Peter believed and declared that their faith in Jesus, he says, Silver and gold have we none, but what we have we will give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And he was healed. He wasn't even asking for healing. And he was healed by Peter's faith. Acts 3, verses 1 to 10. So sometimes the faith of others, perhaps the elder's faith, is what matters. Certainly if you're anointing a toddler, it can't be the toddler's faith. Unless they understand already, old enough. Or if we're praying for someone who's in a coma, it can't be their faith. So it could be the elder's faith or the ones that are in the room. That's why Jesus even scooted out people out of the room who may not have had enough faith. In Luke 5, be turning there with me if you don't mind, Luke 5, there was a paralyzed man who was uh, let down through an opening in the roof, in the ceiling, that the friends that couldn't get through to Jesus because of the crowd. And so they went on the roof and opened up the tiling up there enough to be able to drop this guy down on, on his on his mat, his blanket, whatever, his bed, they call it, by ropes down to Jesus. So Luke 5, verse 18 and 19, say what I just said. So they went up on the housetop and, ran, and, and let him down with his bed 
through the tithing into the midst before Jesus. That's verse 19. Luke 5, verse 20. <clears throat> when he, that's Jesus, saw their faith, not his faith. It may have included him. But when he saw his friend's faith, wow, these guys are going to make a hole in the ceiling, to, a big hole to just get this guy in his bed down here. He said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. But it was his friend's faith that caused the man to be healed. But now what Jesus just said there, I covered in part three, we have to accept that sometimes our sins are causing the problem. We have to have God forgive us of any sins that may be causing our physical problems. Just say it to God in prayer. As far as I know, God, I've repented of any and all sins. But if there's any that you're punishing me for, please let me know. But please forgive. Okay? Your sins be forgiven. The man didn't even ask for forgiveness of sin. Jesus just offered it. So th this man had apparently committed certain sins, apparently caused this terrible paralysis. So sin can bring illness in some cases, though I'm not saying that's always the case. So be careful not to be judgmental and assume that. Please don't. But Job's friends, sure, they had Job chapter 4 and 5. And Job, I think it's chapter 4, Eliphaz, Eliphaz, however you say his name. He even admitted that a demon had given him the word. Can a man be more righteous than God? If he's not even trusting his angels, how can he trust this clay pot called Job? <laughs> so they said, Job, you must have done something terrible. Admit it. That's what caused all this. Anyway, you know what sins you have, and you've repented. But I find most ministers are reluctant to bring this up, as we hate to accuse someone of sin. But remember, even in the story of Job, God had to tell those friends later on, what you've said to Job about me is all wrong. And repent and ask Job to pray for you, which he did in Job 42. There was more going on than they realized. But they were so sure that Job was secretly evil. So don't jump to that conclusion. So this man, he said, your sins be forgiven. He didn't say be healed. He forgave the sin as the means of healing this man. Sins had caused its paralysis. And once the cause, which was sin, was forgiven, he was healed. I covered this connection between sin and some illnesses last time in part three. And even James tells us when we call for the elder for anointing the prayer of faith will raise the sick, he goes on to say in that verse, if John 5, 15, if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. So the Bible is not reticent to bring this possibility up. Okay, you guys? It just is not. So elders, don't be reluctant or timid to mention the same thing. In your prayer, talk to the person first, but then say, Father, if there are sins that have been committed that have brought, this on, this inf that have brought on this infirmity, we pray in Jesus' name that you forgive those sins and heal them. This comes up again in John 5, verse 14. John 5, 14. In that story... The other one was Luke 5. Now we're in John 5, verse 14. There was a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. I think some people say Bethsaida. But I think the Bible says Bethesda. And Jesus healed him. Of all the people there, he comes to this one guy. Of course, we're all sinners. They were all sinners. But this one seems to have been particularly sinful from what Jesus said. Maybe. Maybe. John 5, 14, afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, Son, or see, I mean, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So sin can bring it on, that's for sure. 
Miriam the prophetess, Moses' older brother, sinned against God and Moses by her leadership of bad-mouthing Moses to her brother Aaron. God gave Miriam leprosy. You can read that in Numbers 12 as her punishment. Read it. It's a short chapter, Numbers 12. God was pretty severe with Miriam, but kind in that it was only for a week. But she was kicked out of the camp for a whole week. Talk about knocking the wind out of your sails. So sins can be part of the problem, but not necessarily always. Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Boy, it, does it get any clearer than that? But also get this point, that even those fools can be forgiven of their sins and be healed, as Jesus said to several. And if we continue in the next verse, Psalm 107, verses verse 19, look what we read. Look how forgiving and loving God is. It's just amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. Psalm 107, verse 19. And then they, the fools of verse 17, cried out to Jehovah in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them, the fools, from their destructions. So even if you know you've done something really stupid, maybe you got drunk and ended up killing somebody with your car or whatever, and you yourself were injured or whatever, yeah, you can be forgiven. That's a terrible thing to have to even say. But God can forgive you. But that was a sin, a foolish sin that caused your own pain and suffering in the accident. It can't get any clearer than that. Psalm 107, 17, fools because of their transgression and iniquities were afflicted and they cried out and the, God sent the word and healed them. Okay. Um, sometimes sin is going on. So what I've just pointed out is healing can't keep happening indefinitely forever and ever and ever. Okay. We're all going to die eventually if Christ doesn't come back within our expected lifetimes. Healing can happen because of others' faith, not just our own faith. Um, okay. And the third one is sin and iniquity certainly could be playing a part. Let me, read, I just need something to add to my notes here, hang on. Sin and iniquities could be playing a part, that's for sure. And we must be very, very careful not to jump to the conclusion that, that, it, that it is sin. So what else could be causing God not to heal besides lack of faith or sins in our lives? What else? Maybe you're confident you don't have such huge glaring sins, but you're still not healed. You have a lot of faith. You're still not healed. What else could be happening? We have to finally come to accept that even though Jesus did say to the leper, yes, I'm willing to heal you, he was, that was said to the leper. I don't believe that was intended when you take the whole Bible together. I don't believe that statement was intended to be a statement to all of us for all time in every situation. God's will sometimes is to heal us, and sometimes it's not to heal us. Sometimes he wants us to glorify him in our weakness, like the case of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. When I'm weak, I'm strong. And God said in 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you. So then he said, I glorify God even in all the suffering I go through. We can glorify God by remaining faithful in our pain and suffering, as Paul did. This can be a great testimony to others. To this day, we can read of Paul and Silas, beaten, chained up, bleeding stripes on their back, praising God in Philippi, in the dungeon, in stocks, in pain, probably broken ribs, probably a banged up head. God heard them and broke the chains. Please listen to part three, eight keys, because that's one of the keys is to start praising and blessing God even in the pain and suffering. But 
the way he teaches us about our bodies, Paul also teaches us about our bodies as being just clay jars. We're learning lessons in them to glorify God for when we get our real bodies, the spirit bodies. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 to 12. For it is, it is the God, hang on, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So in all the pain and suffering we're going through, a dark time in our lives, and God said, let there be light. Let that verse apply to you. That in the dark times of your life, you can also bring the light of the glory of God in the face, in the appearance of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, I'm reading. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God, and not of us. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Okay, verse 8, we're hard pressed, not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not struck out. We're not destroyed. Always caring about the, in our body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. At the end of verse 11, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh, that the life of Jesus People can learn about the faith of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, no matter what, the peace of Jesus. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Some of you may have heard of Johnny Erickson Tata. She... Um, she had a diving accident decades ago when she was young, completely paralyzed her head to toe for many decades, and severe, severe, severe pain as well. No matter all the prayers and fastings, and God has not healed her. And yet God has used her life. God has used her life to be a witness to so many, including me. Her books, her life, have inspired millions. She did say, by the way, one time she went to a uh, one of these uh, faith healers who claims that everybody who comes on stage with him gets healed. They come on in wheelchairs and walkers and canes, crutches, and he bangs them down or whatever. He bangs them down, he knocks them over or whatever, prays for them. They throw away their crutches, jump, jump off the stage. They're all healed. Johnny says, boy, I'd sure like to have that. So she showed up to one of those. They would not let her get on stage. What does that mean? You tell me. But remember, it's through pain. This is a very big point. It's through hardship and pain and suffering that we are matured, perfected, completed. Even the Son of Man was perfected by what he suffered. Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9, James 1, verses 2 to 4. We'll read those in a minute. We're growing through the pain and the unhealed sickness. We keep focusing on Christ in spite of how much suffering we're feeling. We're being tested. We're being refined. Are we going to throw in the towel? Are we going to say enough is enough? Are we going to say, I've been faithful to you and you won't heal me? Forget it. I leave. I'm not part of you anymore. You know, Jeremiah came close to that. There's a verse in Jeremiah where Jeremiah even says to God, you told me not to worry in Jeremiah chapter 1, not to worry, you're going to be with me. Now I'm in the dunghill cistern or, or, or dump or wherever he was. You have been as a liar to me. He says something almost like that. And God basically says, you better smarten up, Jeremiah. Well, even Jeremiah was tested to just, how can this be? 
God uses pain and suffering to mature us, to teach us lessons, to help us inspire others. Go back and read Second Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, or even 2 to 4. Second Corinthians 1, verses 2 to 4, that God comforts us in our problems, that we can use that same comfort we received to comfort others, and they'll know that we understand. Because, yeah, we've gone through this, the death of a child. We've gone through the death of a husband or wife or, or a husband or wife who wasn't healed or a child or a parent who wasn't healed of cancer and then died. But you were there with them day in and day out. And you can now use that experience as the lady did to me this morning about her being there with her mom day in and day out for months on end. She understood. And yeah, there's the question, why didn't you just heal her? You could have. So why doesn't God heal everyone? He has his reasons. He's trying to help us to grow. Okay, he's helping us grow, mature. God does answer, by the way, every time, his people. Sometimes the answer is no. But if we don't get the answer we want, the way we want it, we tend to say we don't have an answered prayer. God said, I gave you an answer. The answer was no. Or not yet. If your son asks you for a bike, you don't always go out to the store and buy a bike unless you want spoiled kids. So get this, even when the very Son of God, it says he was answered when he prayed for another option. But the answer was no. You have to go through what you and I agreed. You and I agreed that you're going to give your, your life for, for everybody. You have to go through with it. The excruciating pain and suffering. He might have even been uh, fearful of, of knowing he's going to be cut off from God when all the sins of all, the, all humanity were put on him on the cross. And he screamed out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He'd never experienced that before. And as we come to Passover, Lord Jesus, how we love you. You went through so much for us. We don't show our appreciation nearly enough. We want to more and more, but thank you for all you've done. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you're willing to give him up, your only begotten son, your one and only son, to die for us. So anyway, even he had to learn that no was an answer. It says in Hebrews 2.10 that he was made perfect. It says in Hebrews uh, 5 that he learned obedience. Hebrews 5, verse 8, by the things which he suffered. Some of us have suffered a great deal. We're probably destined for greatness in the kingdom because of all your learning through it. As long as you don't give up. Those who have not suffered much, to me, often seem shallow people. Those who have suffered much seem much deeper, much deeper than those who have not. It's just my impression. If you suffered watching your wife suffer with prolonged cancer and then finally die terribly, you've learned some valuable points for all eternity with that. As painful as it was, God was preparing you for the position he has in mind for you for all eternity. Hebrews 2, verse 10 it was fitting for him, this is talking about Jesus, Hebrews 2, verse 10. For whom are all things and by whom are all things? Everything was created through Jesus. God created all things through Jesus, Ephesians 3, 9 says. In bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Even Jesus was made perfect through sufferings. 
Why would it be any different for you and me? We gave our lives to God years ago. He owns us. He can do with our bodies and lives as he wishes. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, <clears throat> after, notice what it says, after you have suffered a while, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So why aren't everybody healed? Because God is perfecting them through suffering that they wouldn't have if he just healed them and they never had any pain, any suffering. Even Jesus cried vehemently, Is there not some other way? Can this cup, do I have to drink this cup? Is there any other way? Let's read what, it, what actually happened there in Luke 22. Luke 22, verses 39 to 45, in the Garden of the Olive Press. That's what Gethsemane means. Olive Press, where they would put olives in this big stone round press, and then another big, big, heavy stone that would roll over and over it and over it and over it, crushing out the juice, the, the oil from the olives. Jesus was in that same condition. The juice from the olives was coming out of him in terms of looking like blood. Luke 22, verses 39 to 45. Coming up, he went to Mount of Olives, and as he was accustomed, his disciples followed him. When they came to the place, he said, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them a stone's throw. Luke 22, verse 41. Luke 22, 41. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will. Notice something. Some people believe that to ever pray, if it's your will, shows a lack of faith. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth, just like it is up there in heaven. And here he says, if it's your will. So don't buy into those who are preaching that if you ever pray, God willing, we hope you'll be healed. That that's a lack of faith. Nonsense. They don't know scripture who say that. Father, if it's your will, says the Son of God here, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him encouraging him. All this is being done for all of humanity, Yeshua. You've come this far. Remember your friend Abraham, your servant Moses. Remember all these people. You're dying for them. They may be forgiven, and you'll be resurrected for their righteousness. And encouraged him. And being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Cleansing the ground that was cursed, by the way, in Adam's sin. When Adam sinned and Eve, God cursed the ground. It will bring forth thorns and briars and so on. These drops of blood were cleansing that ground. When he rose up from prayer, he had and had come to his disciples, he found them asleep from sorrow. Hebrews 5 talks about the same episode. Hebrews 5, verses 6 to 10. He offered up prayers, verse 7, and supplications with vehement cries, loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him, but didn't. He was heard, but the answer was no. You're going to have to go through it. He was heard because of his godly fear. So no is an answer. You're going to have to wait is an answer. 
In your case, I'm going to heal you in the resurrection, is an answer. It's not lack of faith. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. So in spite of all this, he learned obedience in that he said, okay, I'm going through it. I'm not giving it up now. I'm not going to depart from my father now. I will obey. But father is said, go through it. He learned obedience. We learn obedience by not giving up when we're not healed. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. I think it points to Gethsemane when Jesus pleaded if there was any other way besides being crucified and scourged before that and the pain he must have gone through. And then he ended his prayers with, but not my will, but yours be done. It's perfectly okay. Not my will, but your will be done. And if your will is to heal me, fantastic. If your will is not to heal me in this life, fantastic. Let me obey. Let me submit. Let me continue to inspire others with the faith you've given me. So he submitted. He kept the faith. He obeyed. He went through with the crucifixion. That was God's answer to his own son. So why do we think we're anything above that? Will we remain faithful and obedient to him, even when we don't get the answers we want? Even John the Baptist questioned Jesus. Jesus, I'm in jail. I'm going to be killed eventually. He wavered a bit in his faith. Matthew 11, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 11, verses 1 to 6. He sent messengers to Jesus to ask him, Are you the one we're supposed to be waiting for? Are you the Messiah? Or should they be looking for someone else? Read that, Matthew 11. So when God heads us off into a different direction than we want it, sure, it's easy for us to wonder, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? Do I not have any faith? I thought I did. Am I being disobedient? I thought I've repented of my sins and striving to obey with the power of the Holy Spirit giving me the power. And when we're not healed, I have things I wish God would heal me of. I have pain. I have issues. I'm slowly go going blind with retinopathy from my diabetes. That's why I ask everybody to write me in bold letters, larger print. Some people still can't seem to do that, but that's okay. I'll try to make it bigger when I get their tiny print. I can't read it. But anyway, thank those of you who consider my needs too. But I, I'm just saying those aren't healed yet. Go back on your own and read Paul's conclusions when God said, I'm not taking away the thorn in your flesh. And they're rejoicing. Well, let's read it. I almost said, uh, who cares? Let's go back and read it. Second, Second Corinthians 12. Let's just read it. Paul had seen all these wonderful visions of going to heaven. A thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. See, even Paul had some spirit of infirmity of some kind going on. Remember in the sample prayer, the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one, is what it should say. Not just deliver us from evil, but deliver us from the evil one. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. I've been to heaven in vision. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Are you there? My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities. Therefore, I take pleasure. 
Are you there? I take pleasure in infirmity. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, in case you don't believe I'm reading the Bible. I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He's strong in the power of God. Be, be strong in the power of His might, he says in Ephesians 6. Wow. One more thing, a couple more things I want to say before we wrap it up. Learn to pray to Jesus as well. Stephen did when he was being killed, rocks pounding against his head. Acts 7, 59 and 60. Do, some of you hearing this have never prayed to Jesus. You might be missing out some answers because of that. John 14, 14, in the interlinear Greek, it says, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He doesn't just say if you ask the Father. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Some of you don't make a habit of saying in Jesus' name at the end of your prayers. I don't understand that. Why not pray in the power and authority of the Son of God in His name? That's what it means. When you do something in someone's name, you do it by their authority. I was outside the yard one time working in the yard and supper was ready and um, my wife had asked our oldest grandson, he was maybe, I don't know how old he was then, maybe, uh, maybe 10 or 11 years old, and he came out and he said, Papi, dinner's ready and Nan says to come in no, he, no I'm sorry he said and so I'm telling you in the name of Nan you are to come in <laughs> I got a big kick out of that Nan is what they call grandma my wife in Nan's name come in so I came in <laughs> Many of you pray only to God the Father. That's great. Jesus taught us to pray our Father in heaven. But it's fine to pray to Jesus too. He's God too. He's the one Moses talked to. He's the one Abraham talked to. He's the one Adam and Eve talked to. He's the one, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel and said. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah and said. The word of the Lord is Jesus. And they talked to him. But somehow we feel in the new, new covenant we just talked to Father. Because Jesus said, pray our Father in heaven. Pray to Jesus too. My wife gave me this next point. I thought it was great. The bigger, broader picture. The bigger, broader picture. Sometimes God holds back from giving us what we want when we want it because he can see a bigger consequence of all actions that he does and that we do. If I'm healed or not healed, what's the consequences of not being healed? What are the consequences of being healed in the lives of others? Will they continue to learn patience and be refined? there may be consequences we just don't see if God always gave us what we wanted how we wanted when we wanted there's even the country song you know thank God for unanswered prayer my wife and I disagree with the title he got his answer but we always most of the world thinks of unanswered prayers as, as prayers that aren't given the answers we ask for like I've said all along here now, God answers sometimes with no, not yet, or I have something better in mind, or something later in mind. The singer was happy God didn't give him the woman he prayed for to be his wife when he was much younger. Now he found this other woman, and she's just a wonderful wife. Thank God for unanswered prayer. You may want to look up the song. What would our lives be like right now if our son David had been had been totally healed, not allowed to die. What lessons did I learn that I would not have learned 
had he been healed? What people could we have comforted or not comforted if had he been healed? So many times when someone dies and my wife sends a card or a note, a note comes back saying, you must have gone through this yourself. Because unless a person has gone through it, they could not have written the way you did. We don't tell people necessarily and when we write them about a death that we've lost our son too. But they can tell because of 2 Corinthians 1 verses 2, 3, and 4 that we can comfort others with the comfort we received from God. Now turn to 1 Peter 1. There are other big reasons why sometimes healings and answers don't come the way we want. God is testing your faith. He's refining your faith. Will you continue to trust Him, love Him, and obey Him? I've kind of said that already, but I want to burst to read to you. Even when we don't get the answers we want, our faith and our perseverance has to be tested and refined. I read earlier how Jesus, He was made perfect by the things which He suffered. Hebrews 2.10, so are we. Look at this one, 1 Peter 1, verses 6 to 9. He says, you're, you're greatly rejoicing, 1 Peter 1, 6 to 9. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, that the genuineness of your faith, much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory. I remember a sermon years ago when I was probably a teenager. If I could give you a choice to have either a severe test, a severe trial, that will test your faith, it's so severe, or I can give you a gold bar, which would you pick? And I believe that minister this is a sermon going back, wow, going back maybe 55 years. I still remember it. Which would you take? If we were smart, we would take the testing of the genuineness of our faith by various trials. Anyway, tested by fire, they may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love though now you don't see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible full of glory receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls we have to go through some suffering let's read James 1 James 1 verses 2 to 4 James 1, 2-4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. By the way, 1 Peter 5.10 also says to us that after we've been perfect, you know, we have to suffer and then we're perfected. I read that earlier, I think. James 1, verses 2-4, Count it joy when you fall into various trials. So yeah, right. Count it all joy knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If God took away all our trials, if God always healed everybody right away or even at all, we wouldn't have the testing of our faith producing patience. We wouldn't have the perfect work, uh, work happening that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Are you seeing why God doesn't always heal us? Are you seeing why? I hope so. Now, so God may not be answering all of our prayers right now that we would like him to the way we want him to. Because first he has to teach us that it's not just because we lack perfect faith or that it's 
that, that we've sinned somehow. He has to teach us that answered prayer should be seen being far wider than we thought before. Answered prayers can include no and not yet. He's perfecting us for the roles he wants us to fill for all eternity that only our suffering can prepare us for. Someday we'll look back and understand. He's refining our faith, testing it in the fire like pure gold, strengthening it, confirming it, getting out the impurities in our faith. To trust him no matter what. He sees the big picture we can't see, the, the, the consequences to others. And what he's trying to accomplish in not just our life, but so many others that touch our lives. We can thank God even for so-called unanswered prayer. Remember, though, that even no and not yet are answers. And he needs to comfort us with the comfort we... He needs us to comfort others with the comfort we receive from him. Those are some of the things I've been saying today. So I hope... If you're not healed, or if you see others who aren't healed, your loved one or child or parent or husband or wife, stop jumping to the conclusion that they must lack faith or you must lack faith. Stop jumping to the conclusion that there must be sin involved or even that demons are involved. You know, I, I said in the last sermon, we can say if there's any spirit of infirmity involved, get out in Jesus' name, get out of this life. Not that the person's possessed. But there can be a spirit of infirmity, like the woman who's bent over. All those reasons are possible, but not always the case. God sometimes has simply ordained that we must go through the hardship. It's not his will always to heal us right now. It's not always his will to heal you right now. In spite of what others are praying and teaching, which is so incorrect. I mean, even Jesus said, you know, according to your will, your will be done. So please understand, there's more to it than just faith, more to it than just obedience. Sometimes it's just not God's plan yet to heal us yet in this life. There are lessons to learn, examples to set, inspiration to give others in our pain, like my good friend Paul Gibson's doing in his pain, in his suffering, in his suffering. Like Johnny Erickson Tata is doing in her books and her teachings. I mean, uh, Paul Gibson's daughter is on Facebook so often saying how she's so inspired by her father and his faith that just could not be broken. And he's perfecting us, so I hope that gives some comfort and explanation to you. Why some, maybe you, maybe your loved ones, aren't always healed. Father in heaven, we come to you. We come to you knowing that you love us. You will always do what's best for us. What you think is best for us, so many times we don't think is best for us. We'd rather be free from suffering, free from pain, free from illness. But you're, you know what you're doing, and we gave our lives to you. And we pray that we remember that, as Carol Ann told me today, that we remember that, that you own our bodies and our lives. And you can do with us as you know is best for us and for everyone involved. Jesus, Yeshua, salvation. Wow. You cried with vehement tears and was heard. You were heard. But the answer you got was, you have to go through with this cup. You have to drink this cup. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for being faithful. Jesus, be my life. Be our lives. Come into our life. Let us be as faithful as you were by your living again in us. As we come to Passover, we remember that the Passover lamb, all of them pictured you. 
Jesus, we love you. Be our life. Father in heaven, we love you too, so much. May Father and Christ, may you both come and make our lives, our bodies, your abode. As you said in John 14, 23, that you will come, both of you, and make come and abide inside of us. We, the temple of your presence, your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for the calling, the high, high, high calling you've given us. Thank you for all the things you're making us go through. Thank you in and for all the troubles, all the suffering that we're going through. Thank you in them, for them. Now may the peace of God that surpasses understanding come upon us as we thank you in and for even all the suffering. Father, you're amazing. Jesus, you're just truly, truly outstanding. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.